Between 165 and 180, the Antonine Plague ravaged the Roman Empire, and about 60 years later, between 249 and 262, the Romans were visited by another outbreak of disease, and the resulting chain of events were catastrophic. The 240s stand out in Roman history thanks to recent evidence pulled from climatology. This was a decade which appears to have been characterized by an exceptionally long drought in the southern Mediterranean. North Africa and the Levant experienced prolonged dry spells, and in Egypt, the Nile failed to flood in 244, and in 245 and 246, the floods came but they were not sufficient for farming, and documents from the period make note of unflooded land, a new characterization for Egyptian farms. For most of the decade, Egyptian harvests either failed or were nowhere near the levels they needed to be, and it severely impacted tax revenue for one of the empire's wealthiest and most abundant provinces. When this was combined with a recent war the Romans had fought with the Persians, a war which the Romans had lost, the Roman Empire was not in a good spot. Now this is not to say they couldn't have recovered. They had in the past and they would do so again in the future, but the fortunes of Rome were currently looking bleak. Into this system came a plague, known to us as the Plague of Cyprian, and it has been sometimes credited with ushering in the rise of Christianity due to the religious responses to it, as well as the ushering in of the crisis of the 3rd century. Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage between about 248 or 249, we don't really know, and 258, and it is thanks to his writings, mainly his sermons, that we know much of what we do know about the plague which bears his name. Unlike the Antonine Plague, we don't have much information on it, largely for two reasons. The first is that the Plague of Cyprian did not have anyone living through it who came close to the stature of Galen, Rome's greatest physician and our main source for the Antonine Plague. And the other reason is that the 3rd century is a period when our sources are often few and far between. One of our major sources, for example, is suspected to have been a forgery, and another is one we think existed, but no longer exists and has been attempted to be reconstructed to varying degrees of success. So in many ways, we're going in blind. Now the plague of Cyprian was thought to have affected only North Africa once upon a time, but recent research and the employment of the hard sciences is starting to rework this picture significantly, and the emerging data informs us that its spread was much, much larger across the Roman world. In Egypt, near the city of Thebes, there was a mass grave from this period, and the bodies were all burned and covered with lime. And in 249, we have direct textual evidence of a disease breaking out in Alexandria. And two years after that, in 251, we have a count of a disease outbreak in the city of Rome. All of this very strongly suggests that, much like the Antonine Plague, whatever this was had its origins somewhere in the continent of Africa. The biggest cities were all hit. Alexandria and Rome we've already mentioned, but also Antioch, Carthage, and Athens. And, while we don't have extensive medical reports or mortality figures, what we do have are the sermons of Cyprian, in which he does describe the disease. And he says the following in one of them. The pain in the eyes, the attack of the fevers, and the ailment of all the limbs are the same among us, and among the others, meaning here, the non-Christians, so long as we share the common flesh of this age. These are adduced as proof of faith, that, as the strength of the body is dissolved, the bowels dissipate in a flow, that a fire that begins in the inmost depths burns up into wounds in the throat, that the intestines are shaken with continuous vomiting, that the eyes are set on fire from the force of the blood, that the infection of the deadly putrefaction cuts off the feet or other extremities of some, the gait is crippled, or the hearing is blocked, and vision blinded. The symptoms of whatever illness he was describing include fatigue, bloody stool, fever, lesions in the esophagus, conjunctival hemorrhaging, loss of hearing, and blindness. And there are also scattered hints in other sources that unquenchable thirst was also associated with this disease. For four years that we officially know of, the plague spread from the southeast to the northwest across the Roman Empire, and some sources refer to disease outbreaks for a total period of 15 years. 
Although scholars are not certain if the plague of Kiparin afflicted the Romans for 15 years, or if the other 11 years of disease is something else. Kiprian sermons are our main source for the disease's pathology, but other sources which do mention the sickness make note of three things. In a culture which lacked a germ theory of disease, it was nevertheless realized that touching the bodies could spread the contagion. It was believed to be spread by eyesight, and every source which makes mention of the plague emphasizes the blood and bleeding from the eyes. At one time it was believed that maybe this was smallpox or maybe it was measles, but the study of past infectious diseases, a field which is still only really just getting started, has rejected this because it doesn't quite fit the pathology. Kyle Harper, a historian of ancient Rome who has written the only book-length study of disease in the ancient world, taking into account recent scientific research, says the following. Any identification must be highly speculative. We would offer two candidates for consideration. The first is pandemic influenza. The influenza virus has been responsible for some of the worst pandemics in human history, including the Spanish flu epidemic that carried off some 50 million souls at the end of World War I. The lack of clear evidence for influenza from the ancient world is puzzling because the flu is old and it was undoubtedly not a stranger in the ancient world. Influenza is a highly contagious acute respiratory disease that comes in many forms. Most types are relatively mild, causing familiar cold-like symptoms. Other rare types of influenza are more menacing. Zoonotic forms of the disease, especially those native in wild aquatic birds, can be pathogenic to other animals, including pigs, domestic fowl, and humans. When these strains evolve the capacity to spread directly between humans, the results are catastrophic. There have been four global outbreaks in the last century, and avian influenza, which includes some dreaded strains such as H5N1, remains a terrifying threat today. Pathogenic zoonotic influenza viruses are extremely lethal. They induce an overheated immune response, which is as dangerous as the viral pneumonia itself. Hence, the young and healthy are paradoxically put at risk by the vigor of their immune response. The lack of any respiratory symptoms in the account of the plague of Kiprian is a strike against the identification. But, it is worth reading some observations of the 1918 pandemic. Blood poured from the nose, ears, eye sockets, some victims lay in agony. Delirium took away others while living. The mucosal membranes in the nose, pharynx, and the throat became inflamed. The conjunctiva, the delicate membrane that lines the eyelids, becomes inflamed. Victims suffer headaches, body aches, fever, often complete exhaustion, coughs, often pain, terrific pain, cyanosis, and then there was blood, blood pouring from the body. To see blood trickle and in some cases spurt from someone's nose, mouth, even from the eyes, had to terrify. From 5 to 15% of all men hospitalized suffered from epistaxis, bleeding from the nose. Pandemic influenza might indeed account for the horrifying experience of the plague of Kyprian. The winter seasonality of the Plague of Kyprian points to a germ that thrived on close interpersonal contact and direct transmission. The position of the Roman Empire astride some of the major flyways of migratory birds and the intensive cultivation of pigs and domestic fowl such as chickens and ducks put the Romans at risk. Climate perturbations can subtly redirect the migratory routes of wild waterfowl and the strong oscillations of the AD 240s could well have provided the environmental nudge for an unfamiliar zoonotic pathogen to find its way into new territory. The flu was a possible agent of the pestilence. A second and more probable identification of the plague of Kyprian is a viral hemorrhagic fever. The pestilence manifested itself as an acute onset disease with burning fever and severe gastrointestinal disorder, and its symptoms included conjunctival bleeding, bloody stool, esophageal lesions, and tissue death in the extremities. These signs fit the course of an infection caused by a virus that induces a fulminant hemorrhagic fever. Viral hemorrhagic fevers are zoonotic diseases caused by various families of RNA viruses. Flaviviruses cause diseases like yellow fever, which have some resemblance to the symptoms described by Kyprian. But, flaviviruses are spread by mosquitoes, and the geographic reach spread of diffusion and winter seasonality of the plague of Kyprian 
rule out a mosquito-borne virus. Other families of viral hemorrhagic fevers were borne by rodents or transmitted directly between humans. Arena viruses, like Lassa fever, are spread by rodents. Old world arena viruses are endemic in reservoirs in Africa, and it is possible that the plague of Kiprin was caused by such an agent. However, great rodent borne pandemics will probably have to wait for the Justinianic plague. The distinctive biology of the plague bacterium and its intricate interspecies dynamics make bubonic plague capable of continental scale pandemics. The speed of travel and the scale of the outbreak during the plague of Kiprin would be unlikely for an arena virus. The speed of diffusion points to direct human-to-human -human transmission. The belief that caring for the sick and handling the dead were fraught with danger underscores the possibility of a contagion spread between humans. Only one family of hemorrhagic viruses seems to provide a best match for both the pathology and the epidemiology of the plague of Kiprian. Filoviruses, whose most notorious representative is the Ebola virus. So, that's Harper's take. At this point in time, we really don't know. For reasons which I stressed in the video I did on the Antonine Plague, any attempt to retroactively diagnose something from a distance of about 2,000 years is going to be highly problematic, but the evidence we do have, and the symptoms which are recorded, strongly suggest either Ebola or something like it. It's made more difficult by the fact that our encounters with Ebola have really been comparatively recent and the virus is not fully understood, so it is incredibly likely, indeed it's almost certain, that what I'm telling you in this video will be wrong in a few years. Now, did the plague of Kyprian, possibly Ebola, usher in the crisis of the 3rd century? Well, maybe, maybe not. But what we can say for certain about the effects of the outbreak is that it probably pushed the empire over the edge. The Emperor Severus Alexander was killed in 235, and for the next 13 years the succession was not entirely stable, but in 248 things seemed to be looking up. There was one emperor in Rome, Philip, and the empire was united. But when Philip died in 249, the Roman Empire broke apart, and the empire nearly collapsed completely. And for 20 years there was war and there was anarchy. Although, if you lived far from the centers of action, you might not have noticed anything really going on. The Roman Empire, more than anything else, was an economic zone. Goods from North Africa reached Britain, and amber from the Baltic moved down through the land of the barbarians into the Roman Empire, and it ended up all over the place. Rome had a functioning market economy, and while we don't have evidence of something like a stock market, we do have plenty of evidence that people often invested capital in things like rental properties and businesses. All of that was shredded in the crisis of the 3rd century, and as a result, tax revenue fell, which means that the state could not supply soldiers, and as the famous line from Yeats's poem The Second Coming goes, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Rome was beset by war on all fronts. First, the Danubian frontier broke apart, as Goths invaded across the river and the Black Sea, and then the frontier in the Near East fell, as the Persians, well aware that the military had been devastated by disease, attacked. This strongly suggests that the Roman army had serious problems that went beyond a lack of money. There were not enough soldiers, quite possibly due to the plague of Cyprian killing them all off. What we read in the sources which survive are the assembling of militias all across the empire, to protect territory that the soldiers could not. But why? If we don't want to ascribe a single cause to something like disease, at the very least, it appears to have had a large impact. Out of these 20 years of chaos arose a new type of emperor, a militarized emperor, schooled in war to a degree that previous leaders were not, and almost all of whom hailed from the Danubian frontier. The first of these was Claudius II, who took power after a coup ended the Emperor Gallienus's life. The latter half of the 200s would see Rome transformed by a military revolution, which altered the mechanics of the empire completely. It became more autocratic. Christianity rose to prominence and backed the state ideology. Eventually, soldiers bore Christian symbols on their shields, and where they went, so too did God. The provinces were reworked, the bureaucracy expanded, barbarians clambered at the gates, and behind it all, the plague lurked. 
Pestilence, inflation, famine, and war destabilized the Roman Empire, and a strong hand was required to steer the imperial project back from the brink. The time of the barracks emperors had come.